Leavitt, I'm co-director of the Philip Teddy Center. That's Ed Massessian over there, who's the other co-director. And uh, welcome to tonight's program, Memory, Invention, Imagination. Uh, let me say a few words about the Philip Teddy Center. The Philip Teddy Center began as a discussion about imagination. Imagination being the palette of psychoanalysis, we became interested in what creative people who have particularly strong access to imagination could tell us about analysis, and conversely, what analysis could tell us about the process of creativity. I believe subliminally we must have been responding to C.P. Snow's famous Two Cultures essay in which Snow invaded against the separation of science and humanities in that we involved a wide spectrum of talents from humanities, neurology, and psychoanalysis, including Laurie Anderson, Antonio Damasio, Elaine Pagels, and Jonathan Lear. From the beginning, we were interested in the relationship between mind, the psychoanalytic, and brain, the neurologic, as far as creativity was concerned. Our next round table will be, dis will be devoted to the subject of the critical unconscious and takes place on December 2nd. Our film series continues later in December with a preview of My Name is Sabina Spielrein. On January 13th, we formally inaugurate this space with a roundtable entitled What is Imagination? with Rick Moody, Ned Roram, C.K. Williams, Rocco Landisman, Marcy Cavell, and Financial Times columnist Harry Ayers. And now, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Anne Gollum Hoffman, who is a professor of English and comparative literature at Fordham University and a research, a research affiliate at Columbia Psychoanalytic Institute, who will introduce the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. And <laughs> welcome. And it's, I, I have to say, it's the first time I've been here, and it's, it's a fabulous setting for the study of the imagination. Um, may I share with you some ground rules for the evening? First of all, for those of you who are standing, there are seats available downstairs on the second floor in the auditorium, and you can follow the proceedings and participate uh, via, via video hookup. Um, and of course, may I ask you to turn off your cell phones? And um, in, on this level, once we uh, take questions and comments from people who are here, you must use a wireless, you must use the microphone. It is wireless, you just take okay. it off the... you take it off there, hand. fine. Thank you. Um, and and for those people who are downstairs, there are cards available and pens so that people can write down questions or comments and those will be transmitted up here. Uh, once we conclude this part of our discussion, we will all go downstairs to the second floor and there are books available for sale, for signing by the authors. and and there's a further opportunity for mingling. So tonight's topic is memory, invention, and the writer's search for immortality. And before I uh, introduce each of the participants, I wanted to invoke the presence um, of Marcel Proust, who had obviously a bit to say about this. And I just wanted to read a sentence or two um, that will probably be familiar to you. Proust is calling. With musical, <laughs> with musical accompaniment. I drink a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first, and then a third, which gives me rather less than the second. It's time to stop. The potion is losing its magic. It is plain that the truth that I am seeking lies not in the cup, but in myself. The drink has called it into being, but does not know it, and can only repeat indefinitely with a progressive diminution of strength the same message which I cannot interpret. I put down the cup and examine my own mind. It alone can discover the truth, but how? What an abyss of uncertainty whenever the mind feels overtaken by itself when it, the seeker, is at the same time the dark region through which it must go seeking and where all its equipment will avail it nothing. So, let me tell you um, who the people are who are sitting here. Patricia Hampel, to my right, is the author of two books of poetry 
and several prose works, including a much acclaimed memoir, A Romantic Education, in which she explores her Czech roots, um, and which won a Houghton Mifflin Literary Fellowship. And most recently, she's the author of I Could Tell You Stories, Sojourns in the Land of Memory, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in nonfiction. Her prose is widely published. She's also Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota and has been a MacArthur Fellow. And her most recent work in the memoir genre is um, The Florist's Daughter, which will be published next year by Harcourt. And Arthur Phillips, across from me, um, is the writer of the novel Prague, which won the LA Times Book Award for First Fiction in 2004. And his much acclaimed second novel, The Egyptologist, a national bestseller, is uh, being translated into 22 languages. He lives in Brooklyn, and he has just finished a book. And would that be Angelica, a novel set in Victorian England? So he is with us tonight, coming from having finished that. And Matthew von Unworth um, is the author of Freud's Re Requiem, Memory, Mourning, and the Invisible History of a Summer Walk. He's the director of the Brill Library here at the New York Psychoanalytic, and he is also a candidate in psychoanalytic training. And what I have learned from Patricia and from Arthur and from Matthew is that it is their agent, Marley Russoff, who is the connecting thread that brought them together and really, I think, is in the background of, of the organization of this evening's discussion. So that's by way of introduction. And I think what we might do now is, is invite our speakers to speak, and then we'll ask people to participate with questions and comments. So who would like to start? So, okay, um, let, me, let me pose a question, and part of this is, is a comment, and um, I learned that Arthur, you had said to Marley Russoff that Matthew's book, Freud's Requiem, reminded you of your novel, The Egyptologist, which I, I think that's a fascinating observation, and what I, would like to ask you perhaps to talk about is how each of you found the expressive form that you write in. Because while I think we're going to see plenty of overlapping interests, each of you does write in different genres and modes. So maybe I could ask you that. Well, I don't think someone grows up wanting to be a memoirist, which is what I I've ended up doing, and um, I'm still a little surprised that that's how I make my living um, as a writer, because I wouldn't have liked the idea that I was writing books about myself. That would seem to me to be a, uh, if you, not simply because I didn't want to talk about myself for reasons of courtesy, but because I really felt if you were a real writer, then you have an imagination and you make stuff up and you are able to create scenes and characters and so the idea that I was limiting myself to the first person and my own limited first person was a problem and I think that this is seen by others as well because I gave a talk one time at a school and at a university and there was a kid in the front seat who had his baseball hat turned on backwards, always a bad sign, and he was sitting kind of down and looking intensely bored and all of a sudden he sat up and I was talking away and he sat up and he looked at me with great interest and I thought I finally reached him. And when the question and answer time came, he raised his hand with great eagerness and of course I called on my convert and he said, um, well, I think I get it. Nothing's ever happened to you and you write books about it. <laughs> and that became sort of the watchword of, um, of my relationship. But I think that the memoir, which has, has, has had a strange rise in, literary, in our literary uh, world and culture over the last maybe 20, 25 years, which has been my life in literature too, um, 
has surprised all of us and is kind of a mystery and we wonder why it is. Um, and I think that one of the things that, that is confusing and brings up a lot of ethical questions about memoir, um, you know, what right do you have and are you telling the truth by the way, all of those kinds of questions, comes from the notion that it's nonfiction. It's housed under this great umbrella of nonfiction. And someone once said, ah, oh, that's where the problem is. It should have been housed under something called non-poetry. Hmm. And I do think that, that there is something lyric about the impulse as well as narrative. So um, I, I came to the memoir as a form through poetry, I would say. And I feel that connection always. It's funny you talk about insecurity next to fiction. I mean, I make things up. Um, mostly because I don't have anything interesting happen to me and wouldn't be able to talk about my daily life to amuse anybody. And I often feel in conversations, social conversations, like, yeah, I, I wrote a story today about imaginary people. Uh, that's all I got. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I think I came to it because it comes easily to me, I'm, uh, either uh, because it's lying, which comes easily to me, or because it's amusing myself, which comes easily. But actually staring at my own life until I see it shape, um, I, I tend to skip that part. Um, so I think that that's probably how I stumble into fiction. Also, somebody offered to pay me for it, so that helps. So you don't think you bring your own ex your experiences into your, into your novels? They don't... Oh, I'm, I'm sure I, I exaggerate a little bit. I do bring experiences that I've had, but not, not very closely related. I mean, I lived in Budapest for two years, and I set a book in Budapest during those same two years, and I don't think I can point to anything in the book that actually happened, other than a cat got hit by a car. Um, uh, and yet I, f I feel like the book is very emotionally autobiographical, but there is nothing that happened to me in it. Um, and I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm not an analyst, so, you know. Um, well, I, I'm not exactly sure what genre my book was in, but I had a very specific task in mind um, that sort of chose the form insofar as it is a form. And basically, I was very interested in trying to look at and maybe trying to demonstrate how memory works, um, how you know, all of us live by, uh, you know, live according to certain themes and structures, which we may not be aware of, but which pop up all over the place, which is very much sort of um, of a piece with the psychoanalytic outlook. Um, and uh, originally, I think I had envisioned actually a much different book that actually took vignettes from a, a lot of people's mm. uh, lives, um, or through literature, actually. But when you get down to it, that would have been an enormous book. And it occurred to me that it would have been be it was I could do better what I wanted with uh, one one moment. And Freud seemed uh, a terrific uh, case study because well. Uh, of course, his theme was memory, and he wrote so much about his life and his interior world more than probably almost anyone outside of fiction. And uh, uh, I really hoped to demonstrate, I took this one moment in time, this essay about a memory of a walk with this young poet, um, and m my hope was really um, through my own sort of process of association to uh, to. Sh to show how how uh, you could you could look at, at this one moment and see much of the themes and and concerns that uh, that informed Freud's entire life and work, um, in particular uh, the idea of of uh, mourning and uh, ways of dealing with mourning uh, creatively and imaginatively through work, um, and so. My book, I, I hope, uh, takes that one moment and then unpacks it by associating it to moments all across Freud's life and also Rilke's, because I think one of the things I've come to believe is that memory, uh, as much as it is an interior experience, is also an ex a communicative experience, and that really uh, uh, can't exi um, its primary function is sort of to bind us to other people. Uh, those both those that we live with and also those that we've lost. You know, what happens is it, it, we all have to write a story. We all have to find a narrative. And I think that you think a narrative comes because you have a story. There's a story to tell. 
But the thing that strikes me for each one of us, even though the genres are different, is that you write the story because you don't have the story. You have the pieces that you want to make into a story, that you want, I mean, you don't have a story to tell. Even if you are working out of memoir, in fact, almost more so in a sense, because memoirs don't have plots. They, they just have broken bits of memory that for some reason refuse to go away. And how do you string those beads onto something that has a shape or a form, as, as you were saying? And I think that it's the absence of the story that compels the urgency to tell the story, which means, yes, even for a memoirist, you are, in a sense, making, I don't know if you're making up the story, not in the same way that Arthur is, but you are making it anyway. You are, I mean, I, I do believe in trying to tell it as you remember it, but it isn't about what, in other words, I don't think you should invent things in a memoir and call it a memoir. If you, but I, I also think that if you have these broken bits, they, there's an ine and you're reaching towards narrative, there's an inevitable way that you are making something rather than recording something. Association in both those cases is a, is a res resonant word for me. I, when I'm, often when I'm writing fiction, I'm putting together two pieces next to each other that for some reason seem to go together, even though neither of them existed in my own experience or in any research experience, but there's something about them emotionally that they belong on the same, in the same chapter. This is prior to anything like a plot being prepared. Um, so prior to a story is a feeling of uh, associative importance yeah. or something like that. Um, and again, these aren't necessarily things that happen to me, but they can often feel in, in exceedingly personal, exceedingly emotionally personal without my ever having been involved in them. Um, so I'm obviously a lunatic, but it's <laughs> good to have one of those on a panel. No, but I, I think that makes complete sense, because I can remember in the memoir you mentioned uh, Romantic Education, which was the first one I did, and I didn't, frankly, even understand it was something called a memoir. I just didn't know how else to write this thing, except to put myself as the protagonist seeking the story. Um, I can remember thinking, I want to write sort of in the midst of this a thing about beauty. And there was no logical sense. I couldn't say to an editor or anybody, here's why it connects to the story about my Czech background and going to, the, to Prague during the Cold War, nor did I, of course, know that there wasn't going to be a Cold, that the Cold War was going to end or something. And it, luckily I had an editor who said, you go. And, and so eventually the, the same sense of an intuitive, associative, connection was there, and I wrote it up to, to make it happen, to make it connect. What each of you is saying is seems to be that the correspondence to actual events is really not a major piece of the work that you're doing. Well, and, and Matthew, I was wondering if that wasn't also in your discussion of Freud, that in Freud's writing, also, there is something, I don't know whether to call it associative, but it isn't necessarily the literal historical correspondence that, you know, even in that, that walk with the uh, poet and a friend. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, the, the, for me, the, the, the main thing has to do with the idea that every, uh, everything of interest has its own internal logic, um, and that that's, that tends to be far more interesting than uh, than what you can cobble together from from what is known on the outside. Well, I'm to, another way of, of saying what um, uh, of what you were saying of, of how a, a story. Uh, uh, what I was thinking was that a story it doesn't exactly write itself, but the way, say, in a song, uh, the way a song might be written that that you, you hear a fragment of music, but that it happens within a scale. And that, that there are a certain number of notes uh, that then within within that palette you have to work out the rest of the uh, the rest of the piece so that every every idea every notion um, it's it's not just a random association the two pieces of fiction that you had that came together that they're joined because they must fit together there must there there is a, a structure um, that binds them and it's it's the writers or anyone's goal to sort of find what that structure is. I mean, it's very, uh, you hear people say I write for therapeutic reasons and that's always kind of put me off a little bit. But in this context, 
it's um, the experience is aesthetically comparable to sort of the aesthetic pleasure of therapy or analysis, I would think. The pleasure of discovering that two things have meaning because that you didn't know were related. Um, and you sit up and you say Eureka and whatever. But um, that happens frequently in the process of writing, at least writing fiction. Um, be, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful m moment of understanding something. Um, so that's to me the sort of aesthetic miracle of it and probably why I started writing and quit therapy in the same week. But. <laughs> well, and that also, um, uh, that brings up the question of what, why we write and what it does, you know, and why people read, which is presumably some form of that eureka moment, whatever that, whatever uh, emotional experience you invoke in that moment and create, I guess it must be, there must be some, there are analogs in the reader's experience that they, they, they feel that, that they recognize in the writing some emotional truth, some affective experience which, uh, which works in the, the brain the way some, uh, some drug might and uh, uh, calls to us again uh, an emotional experience that we recognize as true. So it's never not intersubjective, even when you're alone. I think that's true. I, I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Well, even reading is really a participant sport. It's not, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a spectator sport. If it's happening the way you were describing it, I can't imagine anybody writing who hasn't been profoundly affected, moved, changed, or, or somehow made a believer in the way words are put together. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, writing, because um, we, tend, we tend to forget. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, reading. We, we, there's no other form that allows you to, to see a social action happening, a story, and at the same time be inside the mind of whoever it is who's doing it. I mean, movies can't even do that unless they revert to um, narrative technique that belongs to a book, because then they have to do a voiceover. Um, this is an extraordinary thing that, that literature does, and it does it if it's nonfiction or fiction. The nonfiction of the sort that, that you have written and the nonfiction of the sort I have written. Um, not only, of course, I mean, I think maybe some of, for some of us, our deepest attachments in this way have happened in the writing of fiction, in the reading of fiction. And it's interesting, I would make a Freudian slip and say the writing of fiction, because it really is true that you're writing it. I was just hoping I would make a Freudian slip while I was here, and I, there I've done it, and maybe I'll do it again. Um, but um, because uh, that's the whole point I'm trying to make, that reading is a kind of writing if you are passionately involved in it, and you are if you're really reading. I mean, it all becomes a circle. And I would add to that that, that reading and writing are both also of a piece with the same, with the sort of, everyday act of memory and, yeah. and of putting together that we all do and that that's, that's really what is drawn on when people uh, get excited about an experience of reading or of writing. You know, I think the word memory for some of us has a kind of blue neon glow to it. I mean, it, it, it's an always renewable resource for me. Even when, if I hear somebody say the word, I mean, I always feel called in some way. There's something about it that feels like it's the headquarters for the imagination, that there's some part of memory that is always going to be the campfire that, that I count on most, not just as a writer, but as a reader, too. And I was thinking about this um, in regard to my, you know, you kind of, when you reach a certain age, and I've reached it, um, you find yourself looking back at what were the signals that you were going to take this particular path. And I remember standing in a hallway in St. Luke's grade school as a child in St. Paul. Um, and it was an ordinary day. And of course, we were in rows, as you are in Catholic schools. There was none of this clustering about. You were standing there, and you had to be quiet. And a wind was racketing through. It was a spring day. And uh, the lilacs were out and everything. But the, I couldn't see the lilacs. And, all of a sudden, I was filled with this great joy for no good reason. And I thought, and I was about nine or 10 years old, and I remember thinking, I have to commemorate this. 
And really? I mean that word, commemorate. Really? And I thought only a Catholic kid would know the word commemorate <laughs> at the age of nine, but never mind. Transubstantiation, I knew that one too, but um, a commemorate was a word, and I thought back, that's sort of what I've been trying to do all my whole life. And it shocked me to realize that at age nine, I'd made the left turn into my life through that word, which sort of wedded me to the, the work of memory. Forever. Hmm. What form did it, your commemoration take? Well, I knew it was then? in the future, you know. Okay. Okay. But I just, I just knew. I, I don't know what I that knew. That was enough. But that, I just, to, to that was it. And it was you. also key to me because you were saying nothing happens, you know, me too. And the kid who said nothing's ever happened to you and you write books about it. In fact, nothing was happening at the moment I had this surge of feeling. It was just standing in line in a corridor in a, in a school waiting for something to happen waiting for us to be led wherever we were being led. It was a non-moment. It was what Virginia Woolf in her wonderful book, Moments of Being, would have called a moment of non-being. Nothing was happening, but... Right. But you had a strong sense reaction to the flowers or to... No, I, I put the flowers in. I mean, oh. it was that time of year. Oh, for it. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I, but I, I told the truth because I said I couldn't see the flowers. I mean, I just put... I'm a florist's daughter. I'm always going to put flowers in, but, you know, it was... <laughs> They were out there. It was May, and so they were blooming, but that wasn't my point. It was just I was kind of wanted them to be there for the story, but they, they weren't in my mind. Nothing was in my mind. So I just think it's, it's sort of the way you were talking about the interstices between those two events that you know need to come together. Well, but it, it's very, it, it seems like the nothing, I don't think it was nothing that was going on. It sounds like this was a, a, a moment where you remember <laughs> yourself or you recognize yeah. yourself for the first time. Yeah, and in fact, I have now been collecting over the years exactly those moments in other writers. I mean, looking for the moment when consciousness occurs to a writer. And there, it turns out there are many examples. There's a wonderful poem, In the Waiting Room, by Elizabeth Bishop that's about that. And Virginia Woolf, in her her essay, um, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's the main essay um, in Moments of Being, also talks about this. That moment, and, and Nabokov in uh, Speak Memory talks about it early on, the moment when consciousness, you're aware that you are and that you're sentient being. So in what you're describing, both in yourself and in, in the writers you're mentioning, um, there's a later activity of documenting that, yeah. right? There's this retrospective yeah. marking of when it happened. It's so exciting. It's such a, a, a thrill to be alive, well, I guess, is what it amounts to. It? And so you just think, I've got to nail that one. You know, that, that one, the world must know, you know. <laughs> Newsflash, I exist. Um, but something like that is, is part of it every day to feel you get to do this is really exciting, I think. Do you happen to remember your first memory? Oh, I have many. <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's Virginia Woolf talks about this. She says, my first memory is, and then she says, and my other first memory is, you know, um, flashes of light. And I've, that's another thing in my anthology of collecting first memories of others. It seems like they often have to do with light. So that the image, the poetic image comes before the narrative, you know. So the, the, the stringing together comes later. I, I'm uh, scrambling to find a first memory, and I, I stopped at lunch yesterday. <laughs> a little stuck. Well, I have several, and they're mostly experiences of terror and fear. Oh. Although I do have one actually of, oh. of being on my grandmother's speedboat and staring at the front and looking out and seeing the sun, which followed us everywhere we went. That's light. Because yes, I know. I, as you said that, I was remembering, <laughs> and I was entranced by that. Yeah. Oh. I think I think it's wonderful if early memories can can have that quality of in, in, entrancing quality, and I think most of them do actually. Um, for in my little anthology that I, you know, kind of look. I mean, it's very unscientific, but I always watch in memoirs if anybody does. And it seems to me in memoirs people do one of two things: they either go back to that first memory, or they are telling a story, and it's as if everyone is writing a memoir is so shocked to see how protean memory is, that they stop to talk about memory. 
So, for instance, you know, even somebody like Augustine, you know, he tells his story for the first nine chapters, but then chapter 10, he's talking about what is this thing? Mm -hmm. What is memory itself? So it's almost as if the form invites an essayistic kind of response as well as a narrative story. It's funny that you're saying this. I, I, I still cannot come up with a memory. I'm like a week we'll ago now. We'll find one for you. <laughs> but, but I am remembering that I just finished writing a novel in which somebody has their earliest memory and it is of light. <gasps> um, so, uh, yeah, I, mm. it's of light passing through a particular color of a window which I didn't have in my childhood home, and I really? certainly don't have an early memory of light passing through a and colored window, but there you go. This, this, I'm going to check this out. This interests me a lot because there's a wonderful autobiographical, in effect, memoir film called Film Portrait by Jerome Hill, who grew up in St. Paul, and Arthur and I both grew up in the Twin Cities, in which he talks about his first memory, and it's of light going through through colored glass hmm. in a window. Have you ever seen that movie? I'm, no. Not that I can recall. Oh, okay. But, you know. <laughs> but I mean, it's so interesting that. <laughs> anyway. In um in in choosing it's that. in plagiarism suits. If I can't no, no, anything. no. <laughs> you, do you remember the experience of choosing the first memory for him? Did you? Yeah, did I was. You, yeah, I was. Did you scroll was, through other options? Could no, it be? no, no. I was writing. I was writing in a cafe in South Carolina where I write out in cafes. And, I looked up and there was a window, and it was an interesting shaped window, not one I've ever had in my life or association. And then it could very well have been somebody's bedroom window, and it could very well have been colored as opposed to what it is here. And then somebody could have had a memory of light coming through it. And as it turns out, everyone's first memories of light, except I make up <laughs> other my own first memories and put them in other people's heads. So troubling. Well, analysis often pays very close attention to what the earliest things that we remember are, because, you know, to some degree, it's bio biological that the the uh, um, uh, the portion of the brain, which begins with an H, uh, that stores and indexes memory, doesn't really function until uh, huh? the hippocampus. Thank you, until around 18 months. Um, and so there's actually a reason why we have this infantile amnesia. But, uh, but over time, of course, you know, there's no reason we should remember one thing as opposed to another, except for that it, it, it means something to us in some way. And so these, these earliest memories, most people only remember you know, flashes from their earliest years. Maybe they tell us something about, what we, about how we've organized our experience. Also in analysis, they many analysts suggest that you know you pay attention to the very first thing that a, a patient says in a session because this is another way that they might try to we might try to organize our experience um, intentionally or not um, and I think a lot of writers also uh, pay attention to the first sentence or first paragraph of, of books as a, because this is another way that we might encapsulate the whole in the part so out of an associative process uh, where you're not necessarily tracing back as one might attempt to do in an analysis, I mean, what we are saying is stuff comes up and you don't know why, but you respond to it and, and you work with it. It's the brain seems to make metaphors, mm -hmm. and whether that's... Um... As a connective activity, you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. it seems to be the number one output of the brain, <laughs> as far as I can. I mean, maybe it's because I do it professionally, mm -hmm. but it seems like that's what it does, is it constantly takes things which may not, that you get down to whether they have anything objectively in common or not, or any objective relationship or not, whether we've just got spare relationship glue in our heads and we're putting together whatever we can find and making them feel significant to us, because something has to feel significant to us. Really? Um, yeah, I was struck too by this notion that Matthew was saying about the, the spacing between the images, that they aren't connected. And I'm thinking that that may be the, the root of our, our just uh, um, almost idolatry of stories, that we are, our need for them at least, our urgency for stories, is that we, we want to connect those things. And that's what a metaphor is too. It's a connection. It's a... I mean, there's a reason, I mean, we may say it's a cliche that the stars are like diamonds, but I mean, they really are. And, they, and it's very satisfying, and they've, 
sort of that particular uh, simile has earned its right to be a cliché because everybody agrees to it. I mean, there's a way in which even a cliché is a kind of emeritus metaphor. You know, it's it's something that <laughs> has has done its work. It's it's there and and uh, that's better than calling it a dead metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> and the stars are arranged in a certain way the day we're born, and so people who go for the zodiac are excited about having significance and yeah. their personality explained based on such a um, an arrangement of metaphor, essentially. I mean, it's all looking for narrative in a way. It's all looking for meaning, but it's also looking not just for meaning, but for, I think, for narrative and for shape. Because one word that hasn't come up here, which I think is kind of interesting, is the word truth. We haven't talked about seeking truth. We've talked about seeking form or shape or well, meaning sales. or sales. <laughs> <laughs> He'll bring us into the gutter every time. <laughs> He's bestseller. You have to watch. Or out seeking for them. <laughs> connectedness, I think, is also what we're hearing. And I was wondering, Patricia, when you first spoke about this, if, as the memoirist, the the truth is more internal to the structure of what you're doing. To well, it would that it were, but um, I think you just have to be out there, trying to find truth. I mean, in a sense, what. What I always feel is, in order to get myself off this sticky wicket, is that um, it's, it's not that I write, or, or let's not just say me, but it's not that a memoirist or a writer of, of personal nonfiction writes about, or writes what happened. And then we get into problems of double sourcing and so forth that um, we find in journalism, and I have worked as a journalist. but. Rather, it's the story, memoir is the story of what has happened. That is to say, what has happened in the mind about what may have happened, what I believe to have happened. So, so that really it's the story not of my experience, but the story of my consciousness. And that's, that's really, really what, it, what a memoir is. And because the memoir has taken over such a, a large space in American uh, letters in particular, and has been troubling to many people about what, what is this form doing and what is its relationship to truth and, and uh, fact, which are perhaps two different things, but still, I think that um, it, it's a mistake, it's a sort of a category error in some ways about whether we are writing about experience or whether we're writing about the consciousness bearing down on whatever experience we can get into the dustpan. You know? And I, I think that that's, once you look at it that way, that all these issues about fact and fiction and whether it's accurate or not become a little less ethically charged in some ways. They, they find their place. In other words, we have conventions, just as we do in poetry. Um, but it's, it's a little harder when you call this form nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Why do you suppose it's so important to readers to know? To know it really happened, right? Or that sort of happened to you, didn't it? And so you made a story about it, right? Well, you know, it, it's very bothersome to me if someone says to me, well, I, I made up that part. Or, and I, I think it's a slippery slope even when there are uh, composite characters. Um, but I do think the minute you begin writing a narrative, choice is involved, selectivity is involved, language changes things enormously. Was the dress crimson or was it wine colored? I mean, every single choice you make as a writer, in a sense, evades experience. There's, there's that incredible uh, story of uh, Kafka's last girlfriend, um, can you help Dora me? Diamant. Dora D Diamant, who, uh, well, the story about Kafka is always that his best friend, his literary executor, Max Brod, refused his request to burn his. Things and as a result, we all have to puzzle over Kafka, uh, and we're grateful to Max Brod for being a, a disloyal friend and keeping and being a loyal reader, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Dora Diamond, on the other hand, burned him as much as she could. He said, "Burn him," and she burned him. And she really believed that no one could get to his truth without having known him. That when he died, his reality died, and so. Why would anyone want to read these papers? They were private. And so it's as if it were two different cultures, two different belief systems, those who believe in expression and those who believe in, you might say, you know, to put the best uh, point on it, the truth of experience 
and that's all the rest is silence. A memoirist like me would be out of a job with that notion, but I've, I honor that fact that there are people who wish for the silence and believe that's the only truth that there can be. You know, after Auschwitz to write poetry is barbaric. There's a whole philosophy based on this, so. This question of truth is, uh, you know, was one of the first controversies in psychoanalysis because for a long time Freud, uh, Freud's idea of the, the pathogenesis of neuroses was that, that young women or children in general had been uh, abused by their parents, by their fathers in particular. And uh, there's, there's a famous moment in his correspondence with Fleece where he abandons this um, and is very discouraged because he has to start over again. But what he, what he then comes to believe is that in fact these memories that they have of, of these sexual encounters are the result of internal conflicts uh, in themselves, but conflict between a wish uh, for the sexual connection um, and, and a horror at it and the results, the various results which he finds are the, the results of these conflicts that then become neurotic symptoms because they have to be pushed away. And uh, this was sort of the birth of, of the idea of infantile sexuality and, and to a substantial degree of unconscious conflict. Uh, it also, uh, you know, it's, it's the same, more or less, the same controversy that exists today in, in what's called false memory. Uh, syndrome and the question usually as it pertains to to sexual abuse and there you know there's frequently this question of you know truth did this thing actually happen you know for Freud the salient thing was that that it feels like it happened and that there's a great deal uh, you know uh, it, it tells us a great deal about about our conflicted natures on the other hand if 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 the truth if, if these things actually happened, it substantially changes the, uh, both the nature of the event, the trauma, and also it would change the cure, presumably. Mm. Uh, so it, it's, not a, uh, it's not purely an academic question, but then, uh, and I guess there's no real, it, it remains a discussion. There's, there is not necessarily a way to to evaluate the truth statement, the truth value of any one particular claim. How can we have the law? How can we have the legal system unless we, you know, for example, are able to decide amongst ourselves that testimony is uh, capable of being accurate and being accurate, not only honest, but accurate. It's, it's, it has enormous implications, I mean, when we move beyond the literary. Um, and I'm not sure what the answer to all that is. Well, I think we see that's precisely an area where, maybe this is too far afield, but where law is a, you know, law meets its, runs up against its limits mm -hmm. when trying to ascertain motive and mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we might begin yes. to take some comments and questions from people in the audience and those people who are downstairs. There must be runners waiting to <laughs> bring your cards up here, but... Um, and reminder, please use the microphone, which can be removed and passed around. Oh, do you uh, want to come forward sure. and use the microphone? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question that I'd be interested to hear from the writers about voice. Um, my experience as a reader is often that when I'm reading something, I have the feeling of, like, do I want to hang out with this voice? Hmm. Or, or this is a voice I don't really feel like hanging out, so I think I won't finish this book. And I'm really interested in uh, having the writers talk about voice. Thank you. I think that I think a lot of readers feel that way. I think almost everybody probably feels that way when they read that you can be put off by a choice of a few words. Um, as a fiction writer, I'd say that it, part of it is probably uncontrollable. The writer, to a certain extent, is stuck with writing like they write. But to a certain extent, and certainly in the, in the hands of the people who I most admire, there's, that voice is a very consciously crafted um, fiction. 
and maybe is there maybe they too would find it annoying to read in a way for further fictional purposes um, so certainly from a fictional point of view that voice is something you choose whether it's true in memoir or, or science I wouldn't I'd be less confident talking about but certainly it, certainly the people I like who are fiction writers make that voice as a constructed piece of plastically shapeable art. Well, I think that, first of all, it was music to my ears in a way to hear that because I, I sometimes think that's about all I have, you know, that to, the, that's the instrument, you know, that, that is the voice. And there's even a sort of jargon phrase, which I don't like that much, but is, you know, that people will talk about, well, you have to find your voice, or I found the voice, you know, as if it were a lost sock that's under the bed somewhere. And once you've got it in your hand, you know, the job is done. It's, it's, I, I do think, though, that voice, um, I, I read this book, uh, it comes out every year, called um, Best American Essays. And um, the, it has a different editor every year. And, and the year I was reading was, I've forgotten who it is now, but anyway, it was a recent one. And he, at the introduction, talked about voice, that he'd chosen all these essays based on voice. And he, he gave the best definition of voice that I think I had ever heard, because usually it is this finding the voice business. And it sounds very mechanistic. And he said that voice is really um, the way that the mind is singing to itself as it thinks, you know, as for a writer, so that there's a, 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 a musical quality to it for him. And I thought, yes, that's true. And you kind of know when you've got a voice. I wouldn't say that a real writer usually feels like having the voice and it never changes. You have to have, even a memoirist, you would seem to think, well, once you put the letter I down, you're, you're stuck, you know, you're kind of stuck with whoever that is, but you are constantly constructing that, that self in a, for a particular use that you aren't even maybe totally clear about, but it's partly the struggle to find the right voice for this task that you're, you're after. So I, and also I think if you don't have a strong structural sense, and memoir rarely does, you, exactly what you said is the case. You have to be able to want to hang out with this person and to see how they're noodling along through whatever it is that they're thinking. You want to hear the way that they sing this tune, the way that they're going to construct it. it it's, that's voice. Would memory work for you be an integral part of what you're describing as voice? Or is that loading too much into I, it? I wouldn't have thought so, but I, can I pass that? Well, I, the way I think Matthew. about it is, I, I, I think that voice, I, I do think that voice is sort of the critical, um, the critical uh, experience in, in making any work. And the difference is that we all have a voice that we carry around with us in our daily experience, and we don't. Most of us don't have problems using it in our interior monologues and how we talk to other people and the things that we think about. So, but a writing, a writing voice. Uh, is is different because you're writing. You're no longer communicating in your head and to uh, to other people. You're communicating to paper, and the relationship that you strike, the way you figure out how to you know how, what that relationship is, I think really determines. Once you have that, I think a lot of the rest will find itself. The way if you think of a fragment of music, you can map out the scale and then find out. Uh, how it will, how that piece of music will resolve itself, but that's not an you know it's not an easy thing, and there's no way to get there. It's a that's that's where intuition is, and um, I'll stop there. Was your was your voice in Freud's Requiem kind of in a conversation with Freud? I mean, was, did you come to the short essay on transience, and then it worked? Or um, y yes, I mean, I think I was trying to get at uh, what the uh, what would what would be uh, emotionally plausible um, for Freud to have thought? Um, uh, in I imagined what it was like for Freud to sit down and write this this essay at this particular time in his life mm -hmm. with with the emotional facts with the historical facts behind which lay emotional experiences, and I I tried to. Uh, I tried to conjecture about what that would be like. Now, 
my voice in this particular essay was I, I wanted to be very clear that I was sort of not making a whole lot up, um, but I was speculating. So, um, and so that was a bit of a, a, a challenge because it would have frankly been a different book not necessarily a worse or different book if I had uh, if I had taken if I had done it as fiction people have have written novels about Freud as fiction but I was really more interested in in trying to sort of speculatively map out how how so much of a mind might go into such a so such a moment and how you could sort of then read back into it or read back through it you know the whole of that mind or a larger part of that mind and experience you know, also, I think it's important to remember that, I mean, we deal with a material as writers, and it's called our mother tongue, language itself. And I know I started out as a music major, piano performance, and it was clear that you were dealing with, with a material. And I, I've sometimes wished that, you know, we had to go into a language store and buy um, language the way art students have to get their art supplies so we people would understand completely that it's not just ideas it's not just thoughts it's not abstractions it's actually the body of language that you have to deal with and language is a system and you just as music is and you have to you have to learn how to use it and how to employ it so that a memoirist who wants to present childhood early childhood needs to know how to not talk baby talk for goodness sakes, but to the, quite the opposite, how to articulate the the uh, kind of dignity of a child's experience uh, in that point of view, and also have the other voice of the self as an adult. Uh, those are two different voices. And so there, I don't mean to make it sound technical exactly, but I do think it's it's language based. It's about about being fascinated with the system of language and be, and just knowing that somewhere in there language has the answer and if you just keep going it'll give it to you. I mean that's why you're a writer. Um, as as a memoirist myself who is now trying to write a novel I'm really interested because we've had a sort of dis clear distinction between these forms and I found writing a memoir um, the hardest thing was to find a point of view and I for some reason for me for me voice is always an extension of point of view and when I wrote a first draft of a novel and showed it to, to various people a novelist friend said I can't tell if this is supposed to be a memoir or a novel and I knew it was supposed to be a novel and I thought hmm I don't know how to do this and I thought writing a memoir I was being in many ways very objective about personal stuff anyway I read Edith Wharton's book The Writing of Fiction in which she says, among many other things, that memoirists don't make good novelists because they're too subjective and the essence of fiction is objectivity. And for me, that was a light bulb. I mean, for me, you know, it's like, and I was able to start, I think, finally writing something like fiction. Hmm. So whatever that might add. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Actually, I think the, those last two comments are closely related. Um, the when you read uh, a novel and the novelist says he drank some lime blossom or linden tea or whatever, if you've ever had that drink, to take a very small example, you have a memory of it. And with that memory comes all the associations of everything that was happening to you in your life when you did that. And at that moment, from the first whatever noun of the sentence, you and the author are talking and experiencing different things. Um, which is, uh, so the question of subjectivity and objectivity, to me, the more, uh, the more carefully a fiction writer extracts his or her opinion about what is going on in the story, the more um, the reader has a freedom of experience when reading it to have their own reaction to the story. Um, I would think, not having written memoir, that the, the desire is very much one of Justification is too strong a word, but but self-explanation. Uh, you want to say this is what happened and what it felt like to me and why it felt that way. And I would think that that is very much a, a very communicative experience, and certainly for a reader, a very maybe one to which they associate or one to which they respond. Or, but it's very much a subjective expression. I would think the fiction which I most admire is is 
uh, an extraction of this is what happened to me or this is what it meant to me and is instead a here is a situation which I can imagine and endow with my experience and endow with my feeling and endow with my aesthetic but um, I don't want to tell you how it, what it would feel like to me and as a result 10,000 people can read it and have 10,000 different feeling reactions I think or I'm, or, yes. or I'm wrong or, <laughs> or you're right and and there's this, there's this complication, or double complication. One complication is that you have novels that are written as if they were memoirs that borrow the form. And let's pick one that everybody in this room has read. Um, the Great Gatsby by the homeboy F. Scott Fitzgerald. The book is the story of a deluded guy in love with a bimbo without Nick Carraway's memoiristic narrative voice. Nick Carraway is, goes back to your point too. And so Fitzgerald, in order to talk about this book that we can all see as, as, a, as a myth of America that goes to, to beyond metaphor to an objective kind of um, critique of America, ends up starting and in, in this memoiristic mode and, and staying in it throughout the entire book. He keeps reminding us he's not in New York or Long Island as he's telling it. He's back home in St. Paul and he's back home in St. Paul because he failed in New York and he failed in New York because he couldn't do what needed to be done in this new economic capitalist system and so he's back in old St. Paul thinking about how he failed. So it's a totally memoiristic project. Okay, then let us go from the great to, to, to well, the... Hold on a second, though. Nick Carraway didn't exist. Nick Carraway had to be created as a memoirist in order for the novel to be written. In other words, why is it that the memoir is the form that Fitzgerald chooses? Then let me just put this other one. This, now we, on the scale, that scale is way down. This scale is a feather. The piece I'm putting on the other side is a feather. I, when I first started giving public readings of... of this thing that people told me was a memoir, I would read a couple things that I thought people would like and one was about my grandmother's Sunday dinner and the other was about her garden and I would read them and, and indeed people would maybe come up afterwards and if they said anything about what I had read it would be, I loved that scene about your grandmother's dinner and I came to know that was the last time, the last time we would hear anything about my grandmother. And from then on, it was about this person's grandmother and that person's grandmother. And, and the other one wasn't a grandmother, it was an aunt, but it was the same idea. And pretty soon they were off to the races in the right. same way that you described right. for fiction. And, you know, for a moment I wanted to say, well, no, my, my grandmother wasn't. And then I thought, this is, I'm in the economy of literature here. Right. This isn't a social exchange. We're not having a social exchange about my grandmother. We're talking about the, the economics of literature. You t I tell you my story, you get yours. Right. So I don't know that it's that different. That's true. But anyway, but the part about, about you were, that I, about, uh, you wanted to say about the fist show. No, it wasn't that good. I'll okay. say that. Oh. People have to come back for the next seminar. Okay, and okay. So save right. the care Patricia, would, would you say also that, and I'm wondering if this might be true of what Fitzgerald's representing in Great Gatsby also, that it is the portrayal of the process of attempting to work with memory. I think that's in your I writing also. You, you're but, showing the process. This turned out to be true. I rearranged. You know, you're, you're letting that. And the elegiac yeah. feeling that I think I even knew at age nine in that corridor. You know, the word commemorate is the thing you do with dead people. It's not something that you do about, you know, it wasn't, I didn't say I want to celebrate this. I, you know, I think that um, there's an elegiac quality to, memor to, to memory mm -hmm. automatically. It's, it's got the this, this scent of, you know, of wilting roses all about it right from the beginning, memory. It isn't just something wonderful, it's something dead, because it's gone. Matthew, you address this in terms of mourning, don't you? Um, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I think, That's uh, your subject. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 it is in Yours the book, Freud's. it's one of Freud's subjects. Yeah. It's, it's not the only subject. I mean, Freud, Freud talks about creativity in a specific way, and he calls it sublimation, and he regards it as this wonderful process, um, essentially by which we renounce um, the beast in us, um, we renounce our 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 uncontrollable impulses, but we resolve them and and 
uh, the, the, the example he gives in, I think, to the Vienna um, Psychoanalytical Society is from Heinrich Heine, where he, he talks about a young boy who likes to go around and cutting off the tails of little dogs, um, but he grows up to become a great surgeon, thus you know, taking this cutting impulse and uh, applying it to philanthropic sort of interests. So you take, uh, you take your conflicts, essentially, and you resolve them in a way that is, is good for you and for the country. Um, and, and, this is, and that's very much explicitly, this is Freud's idea of, uh, uh, of, of sublimation. And it's very much rooted in his idea the, of, um, of the Oedipus period, um, the period of, of, uh, in which we, you know, we learn to desire others and, and learn to fear others um, and learn rivalry and jealousy. Um, and in language, <laughs> in fact, um, it's all very connected to that. But there's another idea in Freud's writing um, that that he's a little bit more confused and conflicted about, and that's what he calls, or what his friend Romain Roland calls, the oceanic feeling, um, which Freud declares that he can find no trace of in himself. Uh, Roland finds the oceanic feeling in uh, in Eastern mysticism, this idea, it's a, he calls it an idea of oneness um, with the world or with something. It's not very clear. Freud kind of dismisses it and poo poos it, um, says he can't f really find it in himself, but if he had to guess what it was, uh, it was the desire to get back to that original state with mother, the symbiotic state, back to this place you can't be anymore. Uh, essentially to recapture what's lost. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I, think, I think these two ideas uh, compete in Freud's work, but that um, in mourning, uh, the desire is to recapture what is lost in this way, um, it's to recreate an experience that we've, uh, that we've lost sight of and that want to get back to. I'm curious actually to the extent that it is an effort to recapture what is lost whether that's a memory of your grandmother or your garden or her garden or uh, this oceanic feeling what how um, what happens after we recapture because I think it's certain that writing is an effort to recapture something lost I'm, and it's an elegiac feeling and um, it's true I think in fiction as much as in nonfiction but I'm curious when you think now about your grandmother's garden, is it as rich and fulfilling a thought as when you were writing about it? No. And I think Nabokov because writes very often about his, the items of his youth and his childhood that he put in books that he gave as props. He put an ashtray here, he put a tree there, and then he, and then they're gone. Yes. Um, he talks about um, losing things that were of value to him in the rented rooms of paragraphs <laughs> that, you know, if you care about your memories, do not write about them, which mm -hmm. seems to go against what you were saying in a way, but it is, it, it is a sacrifice that you make before you realize what you've given away and then you're enough addicted to the whole thing that you can't do it any other way. I mean, no, absolutely, I don't, I don't have the oceanic feeling about my grandmother's garden that I had that made me write about it. Because it's it's reified now. It's a few paragraphs in a book. Um, the course of the conversation actually made me wonder whether your act of writing is a kind of of um, a death gift in a way, because you sacrifice the thing you love in, when you write for us. I don't th think I knew it at the time. You know, but, but I'm almost, I'll be 60 years old on my next birthday, and I know it now, you know, but it's too late. I'm thinking about the focus of the meeting, and uh, I'm thinking about the relationship between loss, overcoming loss, and creativity, which I think is a lot of what people have been talking about. And one thing that hasn't really come up so far is uh, the role of psychoanalysis in... Uh, sometimes uh, enhancing that, and uh, in the in the patient, but also psychoanalysis as a creative process, which I think is something that uh, those of us who do it uh, feel very keenly, and it's a creative process by both people, 
And you cannot forecast where it's going to go, and it comes to have its own shape in a way that I think has a, a, an important uh, comparability to, to the creative process of writing. I think that for sure is true. Um, and I think, I think people get lots of different things out of it. Um, I think among, of course, among the things that it does is it can often, often disinter sorts of the conflicts that may stand in, in the way of, of doing some of the things that you want, which may include uh, un, ungrieved losses, um, uh, unexpressed angers, and that sort of thing. Um, but there's also the process itself, which is, uh, which is one that I think is all potential in us all, but which is not exercised in most modes of life, this process of association and, and association with, an, uh, with another um, and of your, own, uh, of your own self, your own uh, subjectivity, whatever comes to mind. You start talking and it leads to things and those things aren't accidental. Very rarely does you know, the seemingly um, incompatible association uh, really have no connection to what's going on. Um, so you, you learn, I think, you learn to open up your, uh, your, your modes of thinking um, about yourself, uh, in particular about your emotions. And, um, and you do it, very importantly, um, in connection with another person. Do you think Rilke's writerly fear of analysis has any um, good basis to it? Uh, I think his, I'm sure his fear was authentically felt. Um, I think, and I think, you know, it, it, a lot of it's speculation, but you think about what you know about what we know about Rilke as a person, as a person who related to other people. And there was a lot for him to fear about psychoanalysis, getting into a relationship with another person where he had to be there and he had to, uh, you know, rely on and open up to another person to, to really lay himself bare the way he, 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 I think, never laid himself bare before anyone. I think that already was an incredibly threatening experience. Um, and, you know, I guess there probably were some... Uh, you know, his, his feeling was that he would, you know, I, his, uh, his manifest feeling was that, that if, that the same source of his, of his creativity um, would be the source of his conflicts that caused him a great deal of suffering. Um, and so there is this question, can you, if you resolve your conflicts, um, will you lose your creativity? Freud believed that, that some, this, you know, it may happen, it, it's an occupational hazard, it wouldn't happen in anyone to whom, uh, to whom the, the creative impulse was central. And I think that's probably true. I mean, anyone who is so devoted, uh, you know, who has had this nine-year-old experience that you must, uh, you know, m memorialize or, or commemorate an experience, that's not going to go away. Um, if, if, you know, if I what have if, my days, so we all do, I assume. Well, know. of course, but if I think if you make that you know, months, but. if you know the the content may shift to some degree, if 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 what you write are these very violent stories about you know something or other that's based on a concrete sort of fantasy, that may in fact change and alter. Um, I would I would I would doubt that that anyone that really that finds pleasure in the creative process that finds something in it for them would give it up. Um, if, if you're not getting, if you're doing it for another reason, um, solely for the fact of leaving perhaps something behind in the world, you might not, right. you might not, you might not hold on to it. But if it's something valuable to you, if it's something, if language, if you're a writer, if language is really how you think and how you present yourself to the world, I don't think that's going to go away. I don't think, I think analysis, if you know, can only enrich uh, your use of language or your use of any uh, system that's already yours. Woody, I think maybe part of the thrust of your question had to do with the meaningful shape of these intersubjective activities in a way that analysis, like other activities and processes, is interactive and has a creative outcome that might be discerned. 
uh, as having a shape to it. Because one of the thoughts that I had in reading Matthew's uh, book uh, was whether we could even discern systematically by taking a look at the pattern of late uh, work when a person was far advanced in their in their analytic or therapeutic work versus earlier, and I just think it would be fascinating to find out if there is an increase in variability, an increase in creativity, because uh, I think there is. I think just clinically, if you think about your work with people, things become richer, they become more different, they, they, they become more unpredictable mm -hmm. and more fun. Mm -hmm. so I, it's funny, I read, I read a novel about someone going through uh, analysis and the novelist writes about the, uh, um, su the super, super dictated, super I'm going to lose the word. The feeling that everything is suddenly full of association. Overdetermined. Overdetermined. Thank you. That you walk through the through the uh, you walk through the street and everything seems to have relevance to your past and everything seems to have relevance to your story and your history. Mm -hmm. And that that jumped out at me from that from that novel, The Treatment by Daniel Moniker. But anyhow, I uh, wanted to mention uh, all of you are uh, artists and storytellers of the written word. And you indicated, Patricia, that um, you felt that, that the written word had a plasticity and a flexibility to be able to uh, describe events and at the same time um, present an inner voice. Um, you briefly alluded to the fact that it did it better than film, which certainly may be true, but as a, an analyst who writes about film, I couldn't resist making a comment about that. I think that there are languages that are not solely directly related to the written word. Certainly, the ideas have to be put into words, but um, images in films, if they're well done, can present those kinds of multiple voices fairly well. And actually, it made me think when you were speaking of it, of um, Howard's End, the film of Howard's End. Um, the novel is a wonderful novel. It starts as an epistolary novel, and that's what what made me think about it. But the way it was translated, if it were translated on film into an epistolary novel, uh, an epistolary film, it would have just fallen completely flat. But it starts with a beautiful image. It starts with an image of a woman, 19th century costume with long trailing skirts. And the point of view of the camera is about here. So there's a child following this woman. And only at the end of the story do you understand that this is a kind of um, overdetermined symbol which represents the child's point of view. So I think you know that you have to be able to read the language. We read written language better than we read imagistic language, um, and we need to learn it if we want to get this. But I just wanted to not not contradict you, but just to expand the idea of storytelling uh, into these other away. genres. You know, <laughs> Whitman. Do I contradict myself? <laughs> Very well, I contradict myself. Well, I think a lot of, I, I think a lot of, I mean, <clears throat> finally, art, all the arts are really about inv uh, inv both expressing something, but also invoking, inducing something in, in other people, affective states, feeling states, or some, some other, maybe a cognitive state. And when you think about the more abstract arts, like music, non-narrative music, or, and, and abstract painting, and you, it, you know, those, uh, those have the capacity to, you know, evoke mm -hmm. feelings in people. You know, many of us don't know what to do with them, and we <laughs> instead look at our guidebooks and or try to find out what we're supposed to do with them. But, you know, music was something that that truly alarmed Freud. He claimed he really couldn't understand it. Um, there are some, you know, there are those that speculate that in fact he did understand it and uh, and felt f felt. The, an intimation of what was coming, that being carried away, he compared, in fact, music to this oceanic feeling, and and that wanted it was uncomfortable with going back to that that feeling, whatever that feeling was, connectedness or lostness. Um, so yeah, so uh, language language, you know, writing is uh, has a particular place in 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 the palette of arts because um, it's the one where uh, we're most comfortable with in a lot of ways. The, the entire psychoanalytic profession is founded on association and, uh, 
And Freud himself really starts to look at psychopathology beginning at the Oedipal stage, which is also the stage, more or less, when language is obtained. It's beginning with this, ab it, with this ability to symbolize the world in language that we really keep a record of ourselves and that we really start to formulate consciously or unconsciously our conflicts and, our, um, and ourselves to ourselves. These other forms, painting and music, they may well respond to something that's that's earlier, uh, that's earlier than, than uh, the ability to have language. It's amazing. Uh, where's got the mic? I had a question for Patricia. Um, you have historical revisionism, but do you find that you have kind of a, a version of autobiographical revisionism where you want to go back to the same events and essentially write them in the, in, 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 the, in the context of having lived a certain amount of time and also to Arthur, in a certain sense, uh, putting it in the fictional realm, I mean, there, like, like Naipaul wrote The Enigma of Arrival, and then later in life he seems to have addressed what seems to me to be similar material in a non-fiction context. I mean, is, is there a sense in which life itself, like, and, and in analysis, you are ba basically constructing a story about your life, but the story in analysis is constantly in, in a state of change. So do you feel, do you feel that, you, that, that, that that's in, in effect the flowers? the stories of the past, your nine-year-old experience, something that you would tell differently at one era of your life. Would you like to go back to, to a memoir you've written and rewrite the memoir? Oh. That's an that's a easier question than what I thought was the first iteration of that. Um, a book is a book, and when it's, when it's done, it's done. And so, you know, you don't really want to go, you may wish it had been better or something or other, but mostly you're glad it's done. And, it is something. And you, and you, and you, you, you extracted a certain amount of experience from it. Yeah. And, and narrowed it down to make it writable. Yes. And, and so the, the question is do you, do you want to go back and change it in some way? And, and usually I'd say sort of no. You know, you just, I mean, it's, I always love Whitman because he only wrote one book and he kept adding to it and, and not in the way of Wordsworth, for instance, of rewriting the prelude, but actually just sort of adding more. He knew that he was writing one book all his life. And in some ways, I think that many of us, really, we're writing one book, but they just are in different covers. So you kind of leave that one behind, and you go on to the next one. And your mind, heart, spirit, soul, whatever it is, you kind of have a sense that it's linked, but you don't expect anybody else to care or think about it. Now, I did have this experience, which was unusual. I wrote A Romantic Education, and it was published in 1981. It was very much a Cold War book about going to Prague. And in 19, after the, after the Velvet Revolution in 1989, I had the opportunity to do a new edition with an afterword, which I did. And then in 1999, a 10-year anniversary edition it was sort of like son of romantic education. Romantic education <laughs> return rides again, and you know, so I had this weird thing of being invited to write more uh, of the book. And what was interesting is the first afterward oh, was very exciting. You know, the world had changed, and I quickly got it, and I had a story to tell, and I had a character to follow, and it was all very exciting. In 1999, I wrote a very different afterword, and when it was done, I knew that was, the book was done forever. That then, everything that I needed to do was done. All, you know, and it's a little hard to go into it in the detail of why. It would be a little boring to, to try to describe it, but it is the case that then it was done. And someone who had never read this book, a colleague of mine at the university, came about to read it after 1999 in the new edition. And he wrote me um, an email saying that he liked it, and the, but he could not imagine the book without the afterword. Mm -hmm. And neither can I anymore. But I couldn't have imagined it because I had to wait for the world to change. And also a whole bunch of people died, thereby giving me their story, the end of their story, mm -hmm. you know. What about you, Arthur? Do you have a? Uh, I may I'll take a sort of attention to it, which is that the Nick Carraway part. I'm I'm most attracted to stories in which they're seen through multiple layered points of view, um, and each one is looking back on something that happened even before then. Nick Carraway is a, is a is a work of. There's the story, and there's his memory of it, and that's so that's why I think the book is beautiful which isn't an answer to your question exactly, would I would Fitzgerald rewrite it or something, or would I go back? But the, the stories, 
that I'm most drawn to are things in which there is the event and then there is the re retrospection of the event and the retrospection of the retrospection, the realization that that retrospection was shaped solely by things up here and not down there, mm -hmm. um, which I think is comparable to what you were talking about, the, how analysis reshapes your story of your life every time you look at it. And why, well, I think that what this study was talking about, we do, we do consume old material to produce this stuff. There's always new material, um, unless you've really done nothing but sit and write all the time, which isn't possible for any of us. So there's always, there's always some new material filling up. Except for Proust. Actually, that's a good point, which actually <laughs> reminded me of a question I have for you. In, in, I don't know if it's part of psychoanalytic theory, but does the oceanic feeling consume itself? Uh, well, it, the oceanic feeling isn't part of psychoanalytic theory. Right. It's sort of, it's sort of the the no man's land beyond psychoanalytic. It was something this Nobel laureate novelist Roman Roland wrote <laughs> to Freud. Mean? I think there's this thing called the right. oceanic feeling. Right, I'm sorry, I'm Although, sorry. people today do think of it as what you might call an an an, an element of pre edible experience of the of the feeling of symbiosis. I mean, symbiosis. I ask because if if Freud was saying it's it is a longing to get back to some earlier state, then presumably the, for the thorough exploration of the oceanic feeling would satisfy you and the feeling would go away. In the same way that she doesn't want to write about her grandmother's garden anymore. Well, the question is, what, what is it? I mean, the, if, if it's a longing for a sim, for a, if, if it's, as Freud took it, to be a, a longing for this symbiotic state in which two people cease to be, and become just one sort of ba boundaryless thing. That's that's you know no longer possible, in a very literal sense. Um, so then the question uh, uh, is, w what can happen to it? Can you can you get back? You can have these feelings, these stirrings of of the the very beginnings of of separation from other people. But um, how do they relate to to our more evolved boundaried state? Um, and 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 how we interact with other people, um, because some 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 crumb of of that feeling of of being in and with another is probably at the you know is probably at the core of of our relations with people even now. Uh, it's just heavily limbed with our stuff, our ego. Right. So uh, I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, the, I, I don't know that it can consume itself because it's impossible to, to get back to that experience except as a, as a memory right. or as, as a feeling memory and only partially and incompletely. Right. Arthur, maybe I can say, uh, address that, the oceanic experience a little bit because um, I think that there was a little bit of disagreement between Jung and Freud about uh, in this area. Uh, whether the oceanic experience really is a regressive experience uh, trying to get back into the womb or whether there's something more to it, whether there's a transcendent experience. And I think that's a very psychological matter it, which has to do with the, the degree of development of a sense of self. I think we tend to think of if people regress that they may slip into a psychotic state that, uh, in which they're sort of invaded by the world they don't have a sense of sense to return to, a sense of self to return to, once they've slipped into sort of the spaces between words or the spaces between notes. There's a kind of void there, and they lose all sense of self. But there's another way of looking at it, which is that um, it's possible to transcend a sense of self. And people who have a well-developed sense of self can let go of that and enter into some transcendent space and knowing full well that they can return to their sense of self. So it's a less horrifying and terrifying experience. And it is the kind of world in which one might discover as you walk down the street, or I think you mentioned in one of the, the, an account you read, that everything you look at is filled with resonances. And then one might be filled with a sense of joy rather than dread. Um, and so I think Freud kind of missed the boat with regard to uh, what the oceanic experience was. Well, I think he rejected the, the idea of transcendence. I, he would probably have said, how would you know the difference between it being a regressive experience and one being uh, what you're calling transcendence? Because well, how think, can you get out of it? Really? I think that was difficult for Freud because he never had the experience. I, Maslow later on talks about um, people rhapsodizing about certain experiences. And in fact, your description of your, uh, your grandmother's garden, I think, probably has some of that rhapsodic quality to it that you're filled with a sense of the being of, the, of what's around you and the, uh, 
the excitement of that. It's, it's a sense of fullness. Uh, and there's nothing frightening about it, and there's nothing uh, psychotic about it. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yeah, Zen would be, the uh, logical Buddhism would be a, a subsequent uh, stage of that. There's somebody back here who would. I just have a really quick question um, for Patricia, which is I'm wondering if you've ever written about the experience um, that you discussed when you were nine. And I'm wondering because when you talked about it, it looked like you could be talking about it for the first time. Like, No, I think I did put that in this book. Uh, I could tell you stories. I think it's in there someplace. In one of the in one of the pieces in there, but I I'm sorry I can't remember where because I almost didn't tell it here because I didn't think it was right to invoke something I had written you know because this is a spontaneous conversation, but then I thought it seemed so appropriate to what we were talking about that it might be useful, uh, but I think I I actually I don't think I mean I know it's in there but I, I'm afraid I'm not able to tell you exactly where it's in one of the essays in there. Well, I, I guess my follow-up question or just sort of observation is that I wonder then, I mean, it seems like something that an observation seems for, for me from the conversation is that memory at least expresses itself very differently for different people, whether it comes out in memoir or nonfiction, um, poetry, biography, mixtures thereof. Um, but then also even within one person, I'm wondering, you know, if it may work differently within us because that that experience didn't look reified when you were talking about it. It looked like you could re-experience it all over again right here. Well, this is an art form for me to be here talking to you. So I tried to make it alive for you. So in that regard, I had a, I had a task that I wanted to perform. Mm -hmm. and, and so I did it. And I was kind of aware oh, I did it. And I did almost, for almost ethical reasons, not do it because I... As I say, I thought well, this is supposed to be spontaneous, and I thought, oh well. I just, I, it just was the ball that was in my hand, so I threw it, you know. Yeah, but there is a Santa Claus, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. So it's reified, but you're a very good actress. <laughs> wow. I don't know. It didn't. It just felt like what was in my mind. Uh, we could take one or two more questions, and then, then you will be liberated. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else. Okay, then maybe this is a good okay. point for us to thank the writers and, and also all of you.